Chapter Forty Nine of Varney the Vampire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Carl, St. Louis, Missouri, April two thousand eight. Varney the Vampire, Volume One, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter Forty Nine. The interview between the mob and Sir Francis Varney, the mysterious disappearance, the wine cellars. The shout that had so discomposed the parties who were thus engaged in a terrific struggle came from a party above. Hurrah! Hurrah! They shouted a number of times in a wild strain of delight. Hurrah! 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 The fact was, a party of the mob had clambered up a veranda, and entered some of the rooms upstairs, whence they emerged just above the landing, near the spot where the servants were resisting, in a mass, the efforts of the mob. "'Hurrah!' shouted the mob below. "'Hurrah!' shouted the mob above. There was a momentary pause, and the servants divided themselves into two bodies, and one turned to face those above, the other, who were below. A simultaneous shout was given by both parties of the mob, and a sudden rush was made by both parties, and the servants of Sir Francis Varney were broken in an instant. They were instantly separated and knocked about a good bit, but they were left to shift for themselves. The mob had a more important object in view. "'Down with the vampire!' they shouted. "'Down with the vampire!' shouted they, and they rushed helter-skelter through the rooms until they came to one where the door was partially open, and they could see some person very leisurely seated. "'Here he is!' they cried. "'Who? Who? The vampire! Down with him! Kill him! Burn him! Hurrah! Down with the vampire!' These sounds were shouted out by a score of voices, and they rushed headlong into the room. But here their violent and headlong precipitancy were suddenly restrained by the imposing and quiet appearance of the individual who was there seated. The mob entered the room, and there was a sight, if it did not astound them, at least, it caused them to pause before the individual who was seated there. The room was filled with furniture, and there was a curtain drawn across the room and about the middle of it there was a table, behind which sat Sir Francis Varney himself, looking all smiles and courtesy. "'Well, dang my smock-frock,' said one. "'Who'd have thought this? He don't seem to care much about it.' "'Well, I'm d d said another. "'He seems pretty easy at all events. What is he going to do?' "'Gentlemen,' said Sir Francis Varney, rising with the blandest of smiles, Pray, gentlemen, permit me to inquire the case of this condescension on your part. The visit is kind. The mob looked at Sir Francis, and then at each other, and then at Sir Francis again, but nobody spoke. They were awed by this gentlemanly and collected behavior. If you honor me with this visit, from pure affection and neighborly good will, I thank you. "'Down with the vampire!' said one, who was concealed behind the rest, and not so much overawed, as he had not seen Sir Francis. Sir Francis Varney rose to his full height. A light gleamed across his features. They were strongly defined then. His long front teeth, too, showed most strongly when he smiled, as he did now, and said in a bland voice, "'Gentlemen, I am at your service.' Permit me to say you are all welcome to all I can do for you. I fear the interview will be somewhat inconvenient and unpleasant to you. As for myself, I am entirely at your service. As Sir Francis spoke, he bowed, and folded his hands together, and stepped forwards, but, instead of coming onwards to them, he walked behind the curtain, and was immediately hid from their view. "'Down with the vampire!' shouted one. "'Down with the vampire!' rang through the apartment, and the mob now, not awed by the coolness and courtesy of Sir Francis, rushed forward, and, overturning the table, tore down the curtain to the floor. But, to their amazement, there was no Sir Francis Varney present. "'Where is he? Where's the vampire? Where is he gone?' These were the cries that escaped every one's lips, yet no one could give an answer to them. There Sir Francis Varney was not. They were completely thunderstricken. They could not find out where he had gone to. 
there was no possible means of escape that they could perceive. There was not an odd corner, nor even anything that could, by any possibility, give even a suspicion that a temporary concealment could take place. They looked over every inch of flooring and of wainscoting. Not the remotest trace could be discovered. "'Where is he?' "'I don't know,' said one. "'I can't see where he could have gone. "'There ain't a hole as big as a keyhole.' "'My eye,' said one, "'I shouldn't at all be surprised if he would have blow up the hole out.' "'You don't say so. "'I never heard as how vampires could do so much as that. "'They ain't the sort of people.' said another. "'But if they can do one thing, they can do another. That's very true. And what's more, I never heard as how a vampire could make himself into nothing before. Yet he's done so. He may be in this room now. He may. My eyes! What precious long teeth he had! Yes, and he fixed one on em in your arm. He would have drawn every drop of blood out of your body. You may depend upon that.' said an old man. He was very tall. Yes, too tall to be any good. I shouldn't like him to have laid hold of me, though, tall as he is, and then he would have lifted me high enough to break my neck when he let me fall. The mob routed about the room, tore everything out of its place, and as the object of their search seemed to be far enough beyond their reach, their courage rose in proportion and they shouted and screamed with a proportionate increase of noise and bustle, and at length they ran about, mad with rage and vexation, doing all the mischief that was in their power to inflict. Then they became mischievous, and tore the furniture from its place, and broke it into pieces, and then amused themselves with breaking it up, throwing pieces at the pier-glasses, in which they made dreadful holes, and when that was gone, they broke up the frames." Every hole and corner of the house was searched, but there was no Sir Francis Varney to be found. "'The cellars! The cellars!' shouted a voice. "'The cellars! The cellars!' re-echoed nearly every pair of lips in the whole place. In another moment there was crushing and crowding to get down into the cellars. "'Hooray!' said one, as he knocked off the neck of the bottle that first came to hand. "'Here's luck to vampire hunting, success to our chase.' "'So say I, neighbour, but is that your manners to drink before your betters?' So saying, the speaker knocked the other's elbow while he was in the act of lifting the wine to his mouth, and thus he upset it over his face and eyes. "'Dent!' <laughs> cried the man. "'How it makes my eyes smart! Dang thee, if I could see, I'd wring thy neck!' "'Success to vampire hunting,' said one. "'May we be lucky yet,' said another. "'I wouldn't be luckier than this,' said another, as he too emptied a bottle. "'We couldn't desire better entertainment, where the reckoning is all paid. "'Excellent. Very good. Capital wine, this. "'I say, Uggins. "'Well, what are you drinking? Wine. What wine?' "'Dying divine, oh,' was the reply. "'It's wine, I suppose.' For I know it ain't beer nor spirits, so it must be wine. Are you sure it ain't bottled men's blood? Eh? Bottled blood, man? Who knows what a vampire drinks? It may be his wine. He may feast upon that before he goes to bed overnight, drink anybody's health, and make himself cheerful on a bottled blood. Oh! dying i'm so sick i wish i hadn't taken the stuff it may be as you say neighbour and then we be cannibals or vampires there's a pretty thing to think of by this time some were drunk some were partially so and the remainder were crowding into the cellars to get their share of the wine the servants had now slunk away they were no longer noticed by the rioters who, having nobody to oppose them, no longer thought of anything, saving the searching after the vampire and the destruction of property. Several hours had been spent in this manner, and yet they could not find the object of their search. There was not a room, or cupboard, or a cellar that was capable of containing a cat that they did not search, besides a part of the rioters keeping a very strict watch on the outside of the house and all of the grounds, to prevent the possibility of the escape of the vampire. 
There was a general cessation of active hostilities at that moment, a reaction after the violent excitement and exertion they had made to get in. Then the escape of their victim, and the mysterious manner in which he got away, was also a cause of the reaction, and the rioters looked in each other's countenances inquiringly. Above all, the discovery of the wine-cellar tended to withdraw them from violent measures. But this could not last long. There must be an end to such a scene. For there never was a large body of men assembled for an evil purpose, who ever were, for any length of time, peaceable. To prevent the more alarming effects of drunkenness, some few of the rioters, after having taken some small portion of the wine, became, from the peculiar flavor it possessed, imbued with the idea that it was really blood, and forthwith commenced an instant attack upon the wines and liqueurs, and they were soon mingling in one stream throughout the cellars. This destruction was loudly declaimed against by a large portion of the rioters, who were drinking. But before they could make any effort to save the liqueur, the work of destruction had not only begun, but was ended, and the consequence was, the cellars were very soon evacuated by the mob. End of chapter 49